Hello everybody and today we're going to begin working with your curriculum guides. Now hopefully you were able to identify a specific grade level and subject you want to work with this semester and um, that your district has something to guide you uh, as far as the district curriculum goes. It depends on the district you're in. Some districts are a little bit more uh, in the proactive mode and have these documents on hand. Other districts though um, may not have anything. They may just say our curriculum is the state standards and use that as a curriculum. Wherever you find yourself on that spectrum of being nothing but the state standards all the way up to a district curriculum, I want you to take again a specific grade level subject and identify that and that's what you're going to work with. So uh, in the reading from yesterday you read about the written taught and assessed curriculum. The um, So just a little bit of a clarification there of, of what that is. The uh, assessed curriculum or, or tested curriculum is, is what the state gives and think of that as your state standard. So that's only one piece of this triangle uh, dealing with curriculum. The taught curriculum is what the teachers use and teach from uh, to guide their instruction. So with that said you can see where those two things have to be aligned. The um, the written curriculum, what the teachers teach, in other words, what the district has as a curriculum, and the tested curriculum, what the state based the assessments on. Those things have to be aligned. And that third piece in there is the taught curriculum. Uh, and that's actually what the teachers deliver in the classroom. And so when all three of those things are in alignment, then it's going to be easy for us to uh, work with all kinds of students and to actually go beyond what is is required or is expected of the state. So anyway, that's what we're going to build on. Okay, that, that model there of the written, taught, and assessed curriculum. And what you're developing in these curriculum guides is actually uh, the written curriculum. This is what the district would have or what you as a principal would use to help guide your teachers through the content. And so we're going to see that there are five parts to a quality curriculum guide for a written curriculum. And the first two things we're going to work with uh, this week and then at the beginning of next week, and that is working with objectives. How do we know uh, what to teach? and then prerequisites. What do students need to know up front? Okay, so that's where we're going with this presentation. So, uh, let's examine your documents. So here if we were in class we, we would talk about uh, what you're able to find in your district. Again, if your district uh, doesn't have anything, don't worry. Uh, I'm going to kind of be working alongside you and building a curriculum so that you can see what it looks like as we're going. Um, and I'm going to use uh, high school history. I'm a former history teacher, so I will use high school U.S. history uh, 1865 to the current. Okay, and so that's where we're going to go with, with that. Uh, but take a look at your documents you have, whether it's somewhat detailed or nothing, I promise you, you will add to it and you might even take away or move some of the stuff to an appendix that's in your current, current curriculum documents if you do have something. So when we're looking at curriculum, we're looking, uh, we're asking ourselves four big questions of curriculum, whatever it is. So uh, think of your, your curriculum guide that you have right now. So the first question then, is it there? Do you have a curriculum guide? So some of you are probably saying, yes, I do. This is telling me uh, what I need to teach. Many of you may call it a year at a glance or something along those lines. Um, 
Some of you may not. Some of you may say, my guide is the state standards. Uh, so in that sense, we might give you a, a little bit of credit there because you have something that you're using as a guide. If, if your textbook is your guide, um, I guess we could still give you a, a tiny bit of credit for is it there. Uh, but we're going to see very quickly that uh, it, it, the quality is not there. The, the product may be there, but the quality is not there. So this is a part of design. Okay, you're going to hear uh, a couple of words used throughout uh, our course: design and delivery. Uh, so the first thing we ask about your curriculum guide is it there? And this is of course design. The next thing is it any good? And this is also designed. So these are the things that we're going to work with in this course. I'm going to show you how to design quality curriculum documents for your content areas and then ultimately for the school uh, as well. Okay, so is it there? If it is or not, doesn't matter. Is it any good? Um, and so here we're looking at the quality and this is where we're really going to concentrate our course. The other two questions we would ask would be in delivery uh, and this is the delivery of the curriculum this is what the teachers are doing. Uh, we're not going to address this in our course but I wanted to give you these so you can see what the next steps would be. The next question is is it being used? In other words are the teachers using the curriculum documents uh, that you have. Did you use these in the past if you were in this district? And then finally the last question also dealing with delivery is does it make a difference? In other words, are your students succeeding because of this uh, curriculum guide that you're using? So those are four questions. The two terms are design and delivery and for this course we're going to concentrate just on the design uh, and really the part that we're going to concentrate within design is the question, is it any good? And so I'm going to show you how to create quality documents as we go through the course. So what about standards? Why do we have standards? Are they good or bad? And then I would have you do something uh, on your own in groups and we would discuss out. but. Uh, let me share with you some thoughts on, on state standards. So, uh, personally, I don't have an issue with standards. I think that you need to have something to guide what you're doing. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, the first time I taught AP US history, I was a fairly new teacher. Didn't even understand the concept of advanced placement. I thought it was a chance to teach a specialty class like I took in college. and so. I told the principal, I said, let's apply for a grant and get one of the AP grants from the state and I want to build a class around the 1960s and we can talk about the 60s and all that was going on in the United States. So without standards then, students taking that class might learn the 60s very well, but they're not going to learn all the other stuff that they need to know about. U.S. history since the Civil War. So I say all that to say the standards are a baseline uh, that we need to gauge um, what we're teaching students. And so in that sense I think they're good. Now I'm not saying that all standards are good quality standards. In fact, one of the things about the design of your curriculum guides is that ultimately you would do this in a team and as a team you would figure out the, the, where the quality is lacking in the state standards and you would build those missing pieces into your curriculum guides and you would do that in the prerequisites as we would see um, but overall I think that you uh, have to agree that standards um, or I would hope that you would agree that standards are they're, they're an important piece because they give us direction in what we're teaching. And we're not just talking about state standards here, though we're going to look at state standards, but also national standards. Uh, and there are national standards for just about all core content areas, 
and a lot of specific core subjects. Uh, some of your electives, there may be national standards, uh, but again, you need to build on those because the quality's not there. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I also taught Spanish, and uh, the national standards for Spanish talk about culture and language and things like that. Um, at least they did when I was in the classroom. What they didn't talk about was what we actually taught as far as grammar. So anybody who's ever taken a foreign language class know that the culture is a part of what you learn, uh, but a big part of it really is culture. Uh, and I mean, not culture, grammar, dealing with grammar. So in Spanish 1, you learn about uh, uh, basic grammar things, uh, adjectives, nouns, demonstrative adjectives, articles, singular, plural. You learn a lot about verbs, you learn about irregular verbs, and all this is in the present tense. If you're lucky, you might get to the preterite tense by the end of Spanish 1. If not, you start Spanish 2 in the preterite tense. But nowhere in the national standards does it really talk about grammar in the way it's taught. Okay, So this is where we would add to our uh, curriculum guides just what we expect to see. So this is an example of why you can't just go by standards. But again, standards give us a baseline of where we should be starting. So let's take a look at uh, the Oklahoma standards. Okay, and uh, what I want to show you here is how we first go about what we're doing. So um, how do we know what to teach? Well, we start with the Oklahoma standards. And uh, this, we could say, is the tested curriculum. One part of that triangle from your readings. Uh, but there are some, some gaps in there. And um, we're going to fill those in with the written curriculum. Uh, but keep in mind this basic idea. So there are 175 teaching days in our classes. Okay, So let's put that up, 175 days. Research shows that of this class period, 75% is devoted to instruction. In other words, that other 25% of those 175 days is um, used for maybe a pep assembly, uh, snow days, you know, in, interruptions. So that 175 days, we can't assume that's bell to bell for 175 days. So if we have 175 days of instruction, research shows that 25% of that is used for other things in general. So the first thing we need to do is figure out that we have about 131 days of full instruction. So then what we do is we know that our standards that we have from the state are used for our state assessments. And we know that we typically take state tests about a month before school ends. So we need to back off that 131 by another 20 days. So what this does, this tells us that we have about 111 to 115 or so days of instruction. And the reason this is important is because now you know that you have to cover all the standards, use them as a guide to help you create your curriculum. You have to cover the curriculum within those standards in about 112 to 115 days. So it can't be from day one to day 175 at the beginning of May. You have to finish before that state assessment. Uh, so uh, we say now work with your standards to know what you're going to teach and when. So th this is going to be the first part of your uh, assignment that is due Friday. And what this is, is I want you to figure out how many days you're going to dedicate uh, to each unit that you decide, whether it's an objective or, or, or whatever. How many days you're going to dedicate. I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about in just a second by looking at the U.S. history um, standards and the beginning of a curriculum document 
over U.S. history. So basically you have about, a, again, 112 to 115 days. So if you had uh, nine big standards you wanted to cover, how are you going to divide them up into that 112 days? That's a great question. Okay, And so the next thing then is to look at blueprints. So what I want to do, what I want to do is actually look at um, the blueprint for U.S. history. And so we can pull up the State Department website here. Now this says these are all old out-of-date blueprints, but we're going to use it anyway. So there are your math and reading, science, geography. Um, so let's look at history. Here is the blueprint for U.S. history. Oops, this is 8th grade. Grade 8. We don't want grade 8. U.S. history blueprint. So what this is going to tell us is how many standards we have to cover. So here we can see that we have six overall standards that we have to cover for U.S. history. Let's make this a little bit bigger. But more importantly, it tells us underneath the substandards within each of these and what percentage of the test is covered by the standard. So here is standard one. And you can see here that we have three substandards under this. There are a total of eight out of 60 questions on the state test from standard one which covers about 13 to 15 percent of the test. Now this is important because uh, if you're an American history teacher the first thing you see here is transformation in the United States from post reconstruction to the progressive era 1878 to 1900. So what that tells me as an American history teacher is I'm not going to have any test prior or any test items prior to this time period save a couple of things in here that we're going to look at okay but in other words when you look at the US history textbook it begins and the first four chapters of the book are all reviewed so if I spend a month and keep in mind I have about eight months max to to work on preparing students for their end of course assessment if I spend the first month on something that's not covered at all, I just spent 13% of my time on something that's not even going to be covered on the assessment. So what I can do is highlight those key things and actually start pretty much around 1878 and talk about uh, what's going to be on the assessment. and. Um, I'm going to give you an example of what this actually looks like when we write it down. But, uh, so to give you another example of this, a typical math book, if you start on page one of a typical math textbook, the first 20 to 25 percent of that book is review of the previous course. The middle 60 percent is new material on grade level. And then the last 20% or so is looking forward to the next grade level. So again, in math, if you start on page one, uh, you're going to waste about 20% of your time dealing with things that students had learned in a previous class. And you're not even going to start touching on things that are covered in that course. Um, until well after a month into school. So that's a lot of wasted time. Uh, and so two things you're going to get out of this presentation here are number one, your actual objectives and what they cover, and number two, prerequisites uh, to for students to understand before they can even attempt to deal with those objectives. So what one more thing here real quick and then we're going to go back to the PowerPoint. What we can see here uh, is typically when I used to teach high school American history, by about Christmas 
we would be um, up to about World War I. But you can see here, according to this, that uh, up through World War I, and I'm just going to tell you this if you didn't understand it, you should be into World War I by um, the end of this standard two. The expanding role of the United States in international affairs. This covers World War I. So this is going to be about 25% of the test, which should mean that you have about 25% um, of your class dedicated to this. So by the end of the first 25% of your class, uh, which again, if we're talking eight months, two months in, you start in August, September. By the middle of October, you should be up to World War One. And I just said that typically I never reached World War One until after Christmas. So what happens then is we don't get to the end of this stuff down here, and we're lucky to get to the 1970s. And what happens is this stuff is not covered so 20 percent of the material on the state assessment the students never been exposed to if we go by the way I used to teach but this is why standards are a good thing because they help guide us into this so what we can see then is if we're going to spend about 13 to 15 percent of our uh, the test is spent dealing with standard one we want to spend about 13 to 15 percent of our instructional time dealing with standard one and the same down here so according to this model we should be up to uh, the Cold War meaning past World War two we should be up to the Cold War um, right before Christmas so I was completely off target when I used to teach uh, American history based upon the blueprint so that's how you use blueprints so if we know that we have a hundred and um, 12 to 115 days to teach then what I would suggest is figuring up how much you're going to spend teaching each of these major objectives based upon uh, this percentage here so 112 times 13 percent 112 times 10 percent so that's uh, 12 days or so here I'm going to spend half my time teaching stuff since World War II because half of the items on the assessment are since World War II so that's how you use a blueprint okay uh, let's get back to our presentation so that's how you use that now what you're going to do this is the first thing I want you to do for your curriculum guide okay and this is just in Excel what I've done is I have labeled it a unit however you want to define your unit but but units are easy to deal with the number of days I'm going to spend on this unit and the objectives what objectives am I, am I going to cover we'll fill in the rest of this later all you're doing for your assignment that you're going to submit Friday is you're going to identify the units the number of days you're going to spend on that unit and the specific objective that you're going to cover and let me give you an example of what that looks like so let's pull up here so if we were to pull up the standards for US history so now we have the Oklahoma academic standards for US history uh, for high school 1878 to the present uh, that's what our blueprint said so if we scan down through here uh, first of all we have uh, a couple of process and literacy standards that we will work on incorporating at a later time okay so there's standard one process and literacy standard two but I want to get to the content standard so here's our first content standard and it's a it's a long one but what it does is it incorporates those uh, three substandards I said earlier. 
And now we can look through here and see what the content standard is and what these substandards are and any specific things mentioned underneath the substandards. Okay, so this we said had uh, 13 to 15 percent of our time dedicated to standard one or th the blueprints at 13 to 15 percent of the test items dedicated to standard one. So we want to correspond our class time to that as well. What that means is that based on 112 to 115 days and 13 to 15 percent, we want to spend about anywhere from 13 to 17 days on this. So let me show you how I come up with that. Let's pull up the calculator. So let's take the low end, 112 times 13 percent, that's 15 days. And the high end, um, 115 days times 15 percent, 17. So 15 to 17 days or so we would spend on dealing with the content standard one. So what would that look like then? So let me show you what that looks like. So here I have content standard one. The student will analyze the transformation of the United States through the civil rights struggles, immigrant experiences, settlement of the American West, and the industrialization of the American society in the post-reconstruction through the progressive eras, 1865 to 1900. So I have 17 days I can spend on this. These are the three sub um, areas. And what I've done is I've just determined that um, the first one here, actually, I'll probably change this two to three days. Um, so again, this comes from the blueprint, um, knowing how many questions are coming from this specific sub area. Let's see if we can get back to our blueprint. Uh, U.S. History Blueprints. Yeah, so this one says 17%. We said, saw 13 to 50%. Uh, this may be the newest. No, I don't think this is the newest, but you get the idea of how to use this, okay? So 17%, there are going to be two to four questions on post reconstruction amendments. Um, so, what does that mean? Uh, that means that if we look at our um, standards, post reconstruction amendment, two to four questions. Uh, so, what I've done is I've, this is what you're going to do for Friday. You're going to tell me the, the major content standard and if there are any substandards. You can, you can break it down into substandards if you want. Uh, it makes it easier here, but you can see here that I've said that we need to spend at least 17 days on this. And then I've broken it down into substandards that were given in the guide. So this is the first assignment you're going to do. Okay, uh, You're going to list the standard. You're going to list the major objective with a substandard here and the number of days for each. So let's get back to our presentation. So when you're dealing with your objectives, here are what, here's what you need to keep in mind. Okay. For each of your units, and remember we're going by units, for each of your units you need to provide an objective. And these will be rated on a scale of 0 to 3. And in the end of this course you're going to rate your own by the way. Um, so if you list no objective, you get a 0. If you list a some form of objective, but vague, you get a one. 
if you list the state standard, okay, and, and this is really the state standard here, uh, you're going to get a 2. In order to receive a 3, you need to state for each objective the what, when, meaning sequence within the course, and how the actual standard is performed and the amount of time being spent on learning. So you can see that we've, we're, we're moving into that number three rating because we're putting the days in there. And you can address some of the other things to raise it up to a three. Um, but you, you should be falling somewhere in between a two and a three on these ratings as we go through them. So that's what you're going to do for Friday, okay, is you're going to create that document for the whole year and tell me how many days in the year so that you finish um, with your major instruction uh, somewhere probably, you know, that, that 30 days of, of wasted instruction is, varies. So probably in the end, you want to come out with somewhere around 130 days, 140 at the most, of instruction that you're going to give your students for the area, okay, for, for your, your course. Uh, that last 30 to 40 days, you're going to take up with testing and then the time after testing, you're going to take up with uh, getting ready for the next course in sequence or uh, doing some specialty work in your content area, however you want to use that last time after the test is done. And we know it's sometimes a difficult time for students. So this is what you're going to do for Friday. So then let's move to what you're going to work with over the weekend. And here we have to ask ourselves, do all students start at the same place? And the answer is a resounding no. We know they don't. So we know that when a student comes into eighth grade that some students are ahead, whether it's in reading or simple knowledge, they're ahead, they're working at a high school level, and we know that some students are behind. And this is true even as low as kindergarten. We know that students come into kindergarten, some are ahead, and some are behind. And so we cannot neglect either of those groups of students. And so if we agree, and hopefully we all agree that not everybody is starting at the same place, if we agree with that fundamental statement, then we cannot treat everybody the same way. And so what we need to do is first determine uh, what it is that the students need to know in order to do the work, the objective that we have lined out. And so in order to gauge this, we want to list prerequisites. And this is your second thing. We're going to do this over the weekend, okay? So let me give you an example of what that looks like. So here's a basic idea of some prerequisites here. We're going to color code these in a different color since these are due at a different time. So um, the stuff in yellow addresses the objective. The stuff in green addresses the prerequisite. So if I had a student coming into history and uh, we were going to teach about post-reconstruction um, and we dealt with specifically the post-reconstruction amendments um, then I need to add reconstruction here so these are some things that students have to come in with a knowledge about okay they need to know the causes and the outcomes of the Civil War because the post-reconstruction amendments are going to address those things they need to know about, uh, oh, I said that that was kind of redundant, the outcomes of the Civil War. And they need to know about Reconstruction, the basic idea of what Reconstruction was from 1865 to 1878. And so once they get these things, once we know that they have them, then we can move forward and make sure that they get the post-Reconstruction amendments. Okay, but 
This is just the prerequisites. So earlier I said that the tested curriculum, typically what we see as a state curriculum, has gaps in it. This is where you can help fill in some of those gaps. Um, so if we know, for example, that, uh, and I'm just throwing this out there, this is not necessarily the case. Let's say that uh, fourth grade math uh, says that students will be able to add and subtract double digit numbers. And uh, nothing about multiplication or division. And then we look and suddenly we see in fifth grade students are uh, going to learn how to multiply and divide double digit numbers. Well they haven't even worked with multiplication division with single digit numbers. So maybe we need to back up as a prerequisite the students need to be able to understand the concept of multiplication of single digit numbers and the division of single digit numbers and then they can advance into double digit or triple digit or whatever you're going to do. But you can see how there might be some gaps in there. This is where you're going to fill that in. And later on, when we talk about assessments, and, and this is somewhat filled in, but I'm going to fill it in as we go through our course, so I'm working and doing this with you. Uh, what you can do then is realize, oh, well, these students don't understand what Reconstruction is because when they took history in the eighth grade, they only made it to the end of the Civil War. They actually didn't cover Reconstruction. And so that tells me that I'm going to have to squeeze in two or three extra days to give them a complete coverage of Reconstruction so that they will understand where the Reconstruction Amendments fit into the whole concept here, what we're talking about. Uh, and so the same if you discover, oh my gosh, these students have never learned to multiply or divide and here we have to go to uh, double digits, well I need to spend uh, a few days, maybe three days on on how to multiply and three days on how to divide. That's why we have prerequisites in here so that we can check that to see if the students understand. And if they don't, we can build that stuff in real quickly and get the students ready to understand the content that we're dealing with. I will say the first prerequisites for the first objective are always the toughest because you're building on the previous class for the most, for, well, for everything. Once you get past that, then the prerequisites should start getting easier to understand because you're simply building on your own class. Okay, so that will make sense as you go through, I promise. So just like the, um, just like with the objectives, prerequisites also have a rating of 0 to 4. 0, there is no mention of a required skill. Number 1 or a rating of 1 would state a prior general experience needed. So I would probably give that maybe a 1, what I just wrote up there, but I threw it up there for you. A 2 states prior general experience needed in specified grade level. So what I would need to do then to go back and change that to a 2 would be to put that this came from 8th grade U.S. history because that's where it came from. Number three states specified documented prerequisite or description of a discrete skill or concept required prior to this learning. Maybe scope and sequence across grades. Here again I would address more specifically what the students learned in the eighth grade and I would probably bring in some of those uh, literacy skills as well as part of it to get that full three. Okay, so this is what you're doing over the weekend. So just to recap, Friday, you're going to submit your first curriculum document. And again, divide it up like this. Okay, so you're going to tell me the unit, the days, and the objectives. Uh, then you're going to tell me the prerequisites. This next block is going to be prerequisites. So objective, prerequisite. Uh, so your objectives with units divided into days for the whole year and also with major objectives for each unit are due Friday, July the 6th, and then over the weekend you're going to add prerequisites. So you're going to take the same document 
you're going to add a new column. So along with your units divided into days for each year and also with the major objectives for each unit. And you're going to add the prerequisites needed for each objective. So if you have questions, I'm here to help. Okay, But once you get started in this process, you're going to see that this is very easy to do. It's just this initial starting to see how you're going to lay out your documents so that they're easy uh, to read. And keep in mind, this is the last thing we'll do, keep in mind that what you're doing is you're creating this document for all teachers, but especially for your brand new teachers who come in and have just the minimum skills needed to teach a class. And I was that first year teacher who thought, you know, I'm just going to start on page one or wherever. You know, I had no concept of prerequisite skills when I started teaching. Or I may have and I've forgotten them by the time I got in the classroom. But uh, So this is who you're really creating these documents for, those new teachers or those struggling teachers where they can really use the guidance here um, in their planning. So with that, good luck. If you need any help, have any questions, contact me and I'll be here to help you.